an awful lot who aren't. Um, of the 7%, virtually none of them are going to be academics at Cambridge, certainly in the early years. They might come back, but initially they're going to have to go and start somewhere else. So having somewhere for them to go is really important. So, so part of the university's driver is also to um, really try and get people or, or get our early career researchers motivated about forming businesses around their technology. And that's quite a big driver from our Office of Postdoctoral Affairs. Thank you. So I have more question about this. So when you say that, so um, many postdoc, you, you try to uh, make a postdoc to create a business from their invention, right? And do they like to do that? Because I think when people choose to be a postdoc, they like to do research more than to do the business. Do they want to go to be a researcher in the company instead? Um, I think it's about just raising awareness and trying to show them that there is another possible future. I mean, you know, many of them, yeah, they're going to go into companies, I, I imagine. Um, but actually, for quite a lot, lot of them, it comes as quite a shock to find that they've done a PhD, they've done a first postdoc, probably three years. They've then sort of drifted into a second postdoc and, you know, it's coming up to the sort of end of that second postdoc, been a postdoc for six years, suddenly they're getting too old to be a postdoc because the group leader can employ a new postdoc who's just got their PhD and knows the same information as the old postdoc but is paid half as much. So, and, and certainly, that's what happened to me. And look where I ended up. Um, so, uh, you know, I think um, giving them another alternative other than going to academia or company uh, is great. And some, some of them are going to take that up. So, so we run um, an entrepreneurship competition for our postdocs within the university. And we do that every year. And we usually get around 50 entries, and um, some of them have turned into really good, really good spin outs. Actually, it segues into to the question I wanted to ask. So, on, um, what's, so, so you, you, right now we're talking about students that are uh, in the technical engineering background, they're creating products. How do you, is, is there a lot of cross departmental collaborations? So let's say you go to the business school and say, we're going to have a startup team now, we're going to put that together. Um, so, so what happens is here in the Thai University, a lot of them are very uh, in silos. So, yeah. so, so they'll go into pitch competitions. And I notice what happens is there'll be a pitch competition where you have four members of a startup team, and they're all engineers because it's just the engineering school. You ask them a business question, everybody looks at each other. Yeah. And then likewise, you go to a business school here has a enters a competition that's for business students. You ask a technical, technical question, question, and they all they, they don't you know. Yeah. And so and so, but a, but a complete startup is the four H's. You know, yeah. A hacker, hustler, hipster, and and, and haggler. You know, four. So two are business, the business development, finance, and one's the you know the the, the back end and, and front end. So um so um so what. In, in Cambridge, how was that? Uh, you, you work closely with the business school to try to get some of the business school students uh, to, to, to form, form teams or collaborate in some way. Yeah, so I think these interdisciplinary programs are really important. I think Cambridge, to some extent, has a bit of an advantage because we have this collegiate system. So everyone's a member of a college. All the colleges are mixed interdisciplinary. So if they go to a college dinner, um, which they probably do a couple of times a week, they're going to sit next to someone who does something completely different. So that helps. But also, you know, the business school are very good. They run um, entrepreneurship events. There's a presentation every Tuesday night. Um, they run 
boot camp programs, they run interdisciplinary programs where they try and recruit um, teams from different disciplines and they get them to work on a project uh, probably for six or eight weeks. So it's starting to introduce those business skills um, you know, to the, the scientists and um, some science to the business people. And, and you're right, that's really important. And I think actually um, talking uh, informally to, to Kathy and Carol, I think you see those programs across the US as well. And it's absolutely vital. Um, because you're right, you, you do get that. You do get the, you know, we'll ask them a science question and they're completely stumped or, or vice versa. Anyone else? How long have we got? Ten minutes? I will keep going. <laughs> I think there's about ten minutes. Mm, yeah, about ten minutes left. They're not stopping us. No, no, I haven't. I haven't seen the five-minute board yet. So. Uh, so this is um, circling back. We heard um, from Carol at Berkeley last time that for her university investment funds, they hire or they contract with the professional VC funds. It sounded like your investment committee was made of university staff, but could you clarify? No, or? Yeah, yeah, of course. 30, perhaps we've got um, five uh, of the more entrepreneurial academics, and the rest are business people from across a whole range of different sectors. Because, um, because Cambridge's uh, number of departments and research base is so broad, we just never know what we're going to get. So we, we try and get um, you know, people from, from many different business backgrounds. That said, uh, half the spin-outs are life science, half the spin-outs are physical science, um, and you know that's that's pretty much the same every year. Um, apart from probably six years ago, we had something from the Faculty of Music. Um, so, and, and actually, I think uh, yeah, Kathy talks about the uh, the music chip, doesn't she? Yeah. So, so our guys, uh, they were uh, master students from Faculty of Music. They had uh, used the um, basic um, music composing rules to generate an algorithm uh, which would enable anyone to compose music. And they uh, formed their company and they were you know, um, allowing access to, to use the, the, the tool so that people who were generating their own videos could do accompanying music which wasn't going to be removed by YouTube for copyright reasons. Yes? Um, I, I remember you mentioned this morning that for uh, students IT, uh, university doesn't own, right? The students own the IT. Um, but in that case for, uh, let's say, students um, startups, uh, do you have any mechanisms to support them? So, um, so let, let's just clarify. So undergraduates, definitely, they're going to own their own intellectual property. Postgraduates, mm, depends, because they might consider it their own intellectual property, but actually, when you look into it in a bit more detail, there's 20 years of research that's gone on in their lab before they got there. So sometimes we have to investigate in quite some depth, but if it definitely is theirs, then you know, we write them a waiver, um, and you know, if they don't want any more to do with us, great, they've got this waiver to say it's, it's theirs and the university doesn't want any part of it. Um, how do we support students who own their own intellectual property? Well, uh, if we think it's a good business idea, um, we're going to coach them and we will 
um, bring in other management if that's what's needed and we'll invest in it just the same as if it was a staff startup. Um, other than that, there are lots of other opportunities across the university for them to get advice and support. So our business school is particularly angled at helping students so that the business school uh, run a number of programs which are designed to help students with new business ideas. But in that case, do you invest in companies that are not from, like, let's say, alumni or students or like, nothing related to Cambridge at all? So our investment criteria is that it needs to be from the University of Cambridge. And if it's alumni, they need to have been left probably no more than 12 months. So if it's longer than that, we would, we would say no, it's outside a remit. But um, if they're currently a student or were a student within 12 months, if there's no IP, that doesn't matter. We will we'll still look at them, support them, and, and try and invest. I think that's provided that the business is appropriate for something that we would invest in. We tend to invest in high-tech um, companies which are going to generate uh, you know, big multiples of return. Most student startups are lifestyle consultancy companies and we won't go near those. They're, they're just not worth it. So I think this is probably the last chance for any more questions. Um, other than that, I think we've got less than five. We're probably down to three minutes now. So um, if there's no other questions, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you for attending today's event. And I hope you uh, really enjoyed your experience. Any questions, feel free to send me an email. If, if there's anything we can help with, um, please get in touch. And thank you all for your very interesting questions. They really helped. Hi, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, this is the last round of the workshops. So the, the final push. I know everybody's uh, probably really tired after today. It's, uh, it's been a long day. But um, the time will go much quicker the more questions you ask. So um, that's all I was going to do essentially, was going to say, following my uh, presentation earlier today, and you've now had the benefit of wandering around um, the other workshops, um, is there anything that you'd like to ask me that's potentially different uh, in the UK because of our legislation and the way the University of Cambridge is structured um, compared to uh, my colleagues from Stanford and Berkeley. So uh, who would like to start the ball rolling with the first question? Uh, do you want me to take that? Uh, is the Cambridge uh, Enterprise uh, a company based on Cambridge, but owned by Cambridge, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. So, um, yes, Cambridge Enterprise is a wholly owned subsidiary of the University of Cambridge. Um, we uh, created it as a wholly owned subsidiary back in 2006. That was partly because we had progressed to that stage in our maturity where we felt that that was going to give us the most flexibility to move forward um, and give us more flexibility and separation from the university as far as some of the services was concerned. We needed to take control of our own finance team, um, we needed our own IT system and IT support um, and HR so we decided we would pull away from the university and that was really um, exacerbated by changes in the UK Charity Act. So the University of Cambridge is uh, edu an educational charity 
So it's um, so it, its rules of operation are covered by uh, the uh, the. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, the um, charity, let's so call it a charity organisation within the uh, UK. Um, and then there is legislation that governs what they can and cannot do. And in 2003, there was a change to the legislation that said that the charities could no longer make significant amounts of commercial income. So at that point, uh, the University of Cambridge had to move. Um, some of its, its uh, operations that, that begin to make significant amounts of money um, outside of the charitable status. So we were um, um, incorporated as a wholly owned subsidiary of the university. Um, we in fact also have uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of Cambridge Enterprise and that's the vehicle we use to um, undertake uh, contracting for consultancy purposes um, and that's because Cambridge Enterprise holds uh, the intellectual property of the University of Cambridge on behalf of the University um, and we didn't want it to we didn't want to expose that to any undue liability um, through the consultancy operation so they are all of those contracts are um, contracted through uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of Cambridge Enterprise called Cambridge University Technical Services Limited. Uh, the university has another nine or ten uh, wholly owned subsidiaries which it uses for various purposes um, across the university. Some of them are um, executive education, um, some of them are um, commercialising research outputs in other ways. Um, so not the, the sort of standard TLO type stuff that we do, or seed funds or consultancy, but other things. Right, who's next? I'm looking at the second row. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, dealing with uh, companies, who might license technologies from the university. Um, have you gathered some insights to, uh, about the companies that um, do the selection or uh, engage with you most effectively? And just, just to preface this, I mean, corporations are going to be large and siloed. So even if uh, this technology gets to them somehow through your marketing, so to speak, uh, what happens to it then, right? The point of contact and where it goes in the organization could probably, I presume, make a big impact on whether it converts. So any insights that you maybe have gathered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I think we can, um, I would split it into small companies who've never engaged with the university before, perhaps, that have never licensed technology and as far as they're concerned, they're usually very open, um, but they need a lot of educational support. So they need to um, start to understand where universities are coming from and why we do things in the way that we do them and that you know, there, are, there are things around background IP and research rights that we can't change there are um, indemnity clauses um, that we won't sign up to or will require from the other party. Um, there is insurance to be considered. There's reputational risk of the university to be considered. There are some business sectors that we cannot engage with, um, tobacco being the, the main example there. Of the bigger companies, you get a huge range of responses. Um, some are open, they've been through it a thousand times before, they've licensed things from all over the US, it's absolutely plain sailing. Um, you know, they, they, they look at our agreements and go, yeah, they're the same, you know. Um, 
the others. Um, and there, there certainly are some who will try to play the um, hard-nosed commercial partner. Uh, some of them have very expensive lawyers um, who are being paid by the second and um, being paid a lot of money by the second and they, they can be difficult to, to handle. Um, but also, I mean, you know, and, and, and the, they could be from anywhere. There are, there are big companies within Europe who think, um, you know, we owe them a living, they pay taxes, therefore they should get it all for free. Um, where do the big arguments come, other, other than the ones that, that I've stated? Um, probably legal jurisdiction is something else we often wrangle over. Um, not usually on a license, because essentially it's our intellectual property and you want it, so it's our rules. Um, but other things, it may be a bit more ambiguous. Um, as, as the University of Cambridge, we have um, a phobia about signing things under any US legal jurisdiction because we know it's going to be expensive um, and we don't have those sort of deep pockets um, or not that the university would allow us to, to use anyway. So, uh, you know, that, that can be a bit of a problem and a bit of a sticking point. Just expand slightly. Yeah. First, thanks. But uh, how about from another perspective, which is um, the decision maker. So if you're marketing this technology, mm. inside of the organization, who is it typically who's making the decision of whether or not it's you know, relevant and they want to, to purchase it potentially? Yeah, I think it, it depends on the organization. Um, it could be, you know, the people from BizDev that we've been talking to initially. It could be higher up than that. But um, part of our negotiating process is to make sure that we get in front of the person that's going to make the decision. Because otherwise you can spend an awful lot of time, you know, having those negotiations and then having them again. Yes. And then having Which them is again. Why, why I ask. Yeah. Um, and 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 there's there's a definite cultural issue to be aware of there as well. Um, you know, you tend you tend to uh, approach organisations as if they were your organisation. You know how that works. You expect them to behave in the same way. That doesn't work. Um, you know, I think any any group that's been through it before they're pretty well educated they know how it works you know t talking to most of the people in us europe or well, most parts of europe um you're on pretty safe ground um it's it's different if you're talking to uh as we would term it the far east so um japan china that's a different ball game um but that said, uh, again, you, you know, we, we may have also difficulties if we're talking to an Italian group because um, they regard their lawyers, well, all of those, I guess, regard their lawyers in different ways and use them in different ways. Um, the, I would, I would, in my experience, um, that the, the Japanese lawyers once they've negotiated an agreement, if they, and this is an example from the consultancy area, um, once they've negotiated an agreement, every time they come back, it's got to be the same agreement. They don't do it again. Um, but because of that, we've got some, you know, we're, we're essentially um, being asked to sign off agreements that we signed first 25 years ago and we're still si signing new versions of the same agreement. Uh, and actually, the way we do things has moved on, and probably the way things they do things has moved on. But getting that changed, it's not a possibility. Um, with the 
the well I, I guess you know you've um, we've had our particular you know experiences with with China that that finding the final decision maker um, can be difficult um, uh, with Italy uh, most of the lawyers are just really slow and uh, it's going to take six months to get a draft back let, let alone sign it off you know um, certainly with the big um, some of the big oil and gas guys I may be being a little bit too candid here. We might have to censor some of this stuff. <laughs> it's the end of the day, you know. <laughs> Don't put it out yet, for God's sake. <laughs> well, I have a lot of Italian lawyers chasing me. <clears throat> so, who's next? Yeah. Uh, 